A champion is bred from hard times, scarred mind standing on the ledge. The squad grind all time, victory in spite of opposition. Welcome to competition. You pick a side, I pick a side, they pick a side. Take a knee against abuse, they rather you die. Pushing through dark tunnels, trying to shed light. The fight is on the moment we enter the game of life. Get it right for the whole thing, gone dead. Let's go ahead and take it there. Meet me on the edge. Welcome to Edge of Sports, only on the Real News Network. I'm Dave Zirin. It's time to ask a sports scholar one of the most popular things we do on Edge of Sports. Today, we're going to talk to Jermaine Scott, who teaches African-American and sports history at Florida Atlantic University. He's currently working on a book called Black Soccer, Football and Politics in the African Diaspora. Let's bring him on. Professor Scott, thank you so much for joining us here on Edge of Sports. Dave, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. I, I love the background. I feel like I'm in a David Lynch movie with all that red. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, and then, yeah. we try to keep the colors a little uh, fresh throughout the house. So That's Very cool. Very cool. So I, I want to ask you so much about black soccer, what it is, what it means, how you got into that as an area of study. But I can't talk to somebody from Florida Atlantic University without first asking them, about teaching at the university level, particularly at a public university in Florida at this day and time in 2023. What is that experience like for you? Yeah, no, that's a uh, fascinating question, Dave. And it's it's a question that I think about often these days, uh, obviously. Um, it's a lot of anxiety, if I'm being completely honest. You know, you walk into the classroom and you don't know what a student might say. You don't know how a student might interpret what you're saying. <laughs> so there's a lot of anxiety about how you're, how you're teaching um, and how you're expected to relay historical facts, right? And, uh, you know, I teach African-American history. Um, I teach African diaspora history and, and, uh, and, and sports history. And all three of those courses, uh, you know, I teach other courses, but the, the kind of core of my courses has to do with issues of race, with inequality. Right. With, you know, histories of colonialism right, uh, and slavery. And so these are all, you know, topics that are, you know, heavily contested right now in the state of Florida. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of anxiety, but um, there's also a lot of support, you know, within my department, you know, other, you know, other colleagues uh, throughout the department, but also throughout the university um, and throughout the, you know, throughout the university system in Florida. Um, there seems to be a strong cohort of professors that, um, you know, are, th are there for each other, right, and, and are, you know, essentially trying to build community. But as somebody who's been teaching in Florida for a few years, you can tell our audience the vibe is different now. Absolutely. Than perhaps it was a few years ago. Absolutely. Um, you know, I first got to FAU um, in the middle of COVID, right, 2020. Um, so my first year was all virtual. The second year was okay. We started hearing things in the background. Um, and then in the middle of my second year, third year, things started to come in really quickly. Um, and yeah, you know, again, my first and second year felt pretty free, right? I felt mm -hmm. able to express myself the way I wanted to in class. I mean, I still do, right? I, I, you mm -hmm. know, but I, but I have this kind of, you know, haunting, uh, haunting, um, you know, sensation uh, in the back of my head. If I, you know, start to get riled up a little bit, right? I kind of have to, mm -hmm. you know, reel it back in and make sure I don't go off the rails uh, too much. But, um, you know, yeah. So, I mean, I think there's ways in, in navigating it. Um, and I think I'm doing okay of, of, of doing that, but you just never know. Each each semester is a new group of students, and you just never know. You just never know in this political climate how they're going to receive what you're saying. So absolutely. Uh, so let's get to the fun stuff here. Uh, black soccer. What does that mean? Black soccer. How do you define it? And I'm sure you define it more than black people playing soccer. And that's a you know that's exactly how I wanted to start it, right? You know when we think of um, ideas like black music, right, or the black church, right, and this is kind of how I, you know, walk through it with my class. It's like, you know, are we are we just talking about black people playing music, right? Are we just talking about black people going to church, right? And <laughs> that's part of it, right? But there's also uh, something more uh, substantial substantial about it, right? And so what I've uh, what are, what I'm trying to do is conceptualize this idea called black soccer, and it's to look at the ways in which black footballers, black soccer players have used the game um, as a site of political articulation, right? Have, have, have turned the game 
uh, into a space to articulate their politics. And at the root of all of these chapters, which at the time seemed very kind of all over the place, they're you know in DC, they're in Sao Paulo, they're in you know uh, Amsterdam. At the root of all the chapters is an effort for these black footballers to reimagine or renegotiate their relationship to the nation, right? As international footballers, as footballers that are in highly nationalized, politicized uh, spaces, national narratives um, shape a lot of their careers, right? Or shape the political context of the game in these different spaces. In Sao Paulo, for example, in the 1980s, right? <clears throat> Brazil is still under a military dictatorship, right? And that shapes the way in which clubs operate. Well, in Corinthians, in Sao Paulo, a club called Corinthians, you know about the midfielder Socrates, um, they had what they call a, you know, Corinthians democracy, right? Which is where they democratized the entire club, where every player of the club, every staff member of the club, every coach had an equal vote on all the decisions of the club, right? This is in the context of a national narrative of the military dictatorship, right? Or in the Netherlands, right, during the 1990s, the national narrative is multiculturalism. Right. We have all these, you know, different races and we can all live together. Right. Well, you have black players on the national on the Dutch national team who are of Surinamese descent. Right. And they are asking questions about their treatment on the team. Right. About how they are being uh, portrayed in the media. Right. And it starts to add wrinkles. Right. To kind of these smooth, progressive uh, national narratives of cohesion. Right. And so in each chapter, I'm looking at how black footballers are using the game to kind of critique or how I like to put it, play within and against the nation. Interesting to speak about it relative to the nation. We interviewed another sports scholar, Teresa Runstetler, who wrote a book called Black Ball. And it was about the way black people affected the very style of the game in the 1970s in a way that goes often quite uncredited. Yes. Are, can we talk about that? Does that exist? Because soccer is a game of so much more structure than, say, basketball. Do you see a difference historically in how the style of the sport changed by the infusion of the black athlete? Absolutely. Um, and we can find this most noticeably in places um, in Latin America, in places like Brazil, places like Colombia, um, even in places like Argentina, not necessarily uh, the uh, integration of black players, but the integration of the working class, right? The working poor in Argentina, right? They all had a massive effect on the style of the game, right? So when the game is originated, um, it's coming out of Europe, it's coming out of England, right? The institutionalization of the sport happens at the end of the 19th century. And it's a very rigid game, right? You have your your, your defense, you have your midfield and you have your, and you have your attack. Um, and in the European game, it was a lot of running. You kick the ball and you chase the ball. It was very physical, um, you know, man to man, kind of, you know, pushing people out the way. In Latin America, when it was adopted by black players, when it was adopted by the working classes, it became a much more free sport, right? So here we have the focus on the individual, right? Where the players are not necessarily interested in these long passes, right? But they're interested in um, expressing themselves individually with the ball, right? That might look like, um, you know, what we call in Brazil, uh, the jinga, right? The This kind of, you know, the movement of the capoeira, you know, of the capoeiristas, right? We, can't, we see the same movement within Brazilian football. Um, Peter Oleggi talks about the Africanization of football, of course, in the continent of Africa and how, um, you know, working class black players particularly in places like south africa adopted the game and made it and made it their own not only their style of play but also the, their participation um let's say in the in the stands right so how the supporters right are also participating in the match is different um in the ways in which uh the kind of eurocentric european uh ways in which uh the game was created wow this is fascinating stuff what what attracted you to this area of study so i'm i'm uh, i was born in florida born in west palm beach florida um and i was born to jamaican parents and so football in jamaica is the number one sport uh, probably next to cricket but probably probably football is the, no the number one sport uh so i always grew up playing soccer i always grew up playing football um, I, I played it through high school um, i didn't play in college but soccer was always central in the household um and it was also the first space that I began to ask questions about race, right? I would, mm. a lot of my team, I was one of two, maybe one of three black players on the team. And I always wondered why that was, right? Like why, why aren't there more black players 
on these teams. But then I would watch the World Cup and I would see, you know, the Colombian national team. And it was all black players, right? The first World Cup I remember is the, you know, the 1998 World Cup. Um, and I remember watching the Dutch national team and it just had a, a number of black players. And in my young mind, I wasn't associating blackness with, with the Netherlands, right? I wasn't associating blackness with Colombia, right? Or Venezuela uh, or even Brazil, right? And so seeing that I had this tension, right? Like, why am I the only black player on my team in the States? But then when I look throughout the world, I see black people playing the game all over. Um, and so it became a space where I started to ask these questions about race, about identity. Um, and, you know, I had the opportunity to, you know, study it um, as kind of a critical practice, right? as, as, you know, as kind of a critical um, um, exercise to think about the political implications of the game, right? Obviously, you know, joining this long tradition of scholarship um, that, that, that looks at how, of course, sports is deeply, deeply uh, politicized. Interesting. So it captured you intellectually through playing and through yeah, asking questions absolutely. about playing. And did, yeah. did you know going in as an undergrad that this was something you wanted to explore? Or was it that you started to look at sports and society and then thought, hey, when I was in high school, I used to think about this stuff a yeah. lot? Yeah, more the latter, right? I mean, um, I went into undergrad just doing African-American history. That was kind of my focus. Um, and then I actually went to grad school. I actually, my first year in grad school, I was looking at a completely different topic. I was actually looking at black labor movements uh, in New York during the interwar period. But for some reason, sports and politics was just always at the forefront uh, of my mind. And I remember uh, my cousin actually, who's from Trinidad, uh, gave me uh, uh, Beyond a Boundary, right, by CLR James. And this is when I was in middle school. I didn't know, uh -huh. I don't know who CLR James was. I didn't know what Beyond a Boundary was, but I read it, right? And it intrigued me. But again, in middle school, I was I, I didn't really understand the significance of what I was reading. And then, of course, in grad school, Beyond a Boundary is, you know, the seminal text, right? When thinking about this relationship between sports and politics and culture and society. I don't know. Not a lot of middle schoolers are given gifts uh, that are books by black Trotskyists. That, that's that's <laughs> very... Um... It's fascinating, right? And I had, I had no idea at the time. I'm like, okay, yeah. see you later. <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> That's a special gift at that age. M m much credit and love. Yeah, uh, <laughs> shout out to, yeah, shout out to my cousin Robbie. <laughs> yeah, shout out indeed. Um, yeah. Okay, so other than Pele, who is completely yeah. obvious, who yeah. are the black soccer players in your mind who truly changed the game? Who should people be aware of? Wow. Um, you know, I definitely think... Uh, people that have changed the game. Uh, we definitely have to think about, um, of course, Pele. There's also a Portuguese player by the name of Eusebio, um, mm. who who really shown um, his 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 true quality in the 1966 World Cup in England. Um, that's a player that's um, of incredible of incredible import. Um, but also players uh, from the African continent, right? Players like uh, Didier Drogba, who played for Chelsea. Um, you know, from the Ivory Coast, who changed changed the way we um, watch um, attacking players, right? His, his Not only his strength, but his grace, right? He's one of those players that finds a really special balance between between kind of power, but also but also really grace, uh, graceful movements on the pitch. So Didier Drogba's one. Um, wow, there's so many. Uh, there's a number from Brazil, uh, you know, Ronaldo, um, Ronaldinho, right? And I'm saying all these players and, and they all have they all have kind of controversial, you know, sure. uh, you know, uh, political backgrounds. Right. But I guess that's the nature of the work. Um, so there's a number there's a number of players. Wow. Um, some of the players that I look at in my own work um, from the Netherlands, we can think of players like Clarence Seydorf, uh, Edgar Davids. These are players from the 1990s um, that added a new dimension to the Dutch style of game, right? Um, mm -hmm. At times they were criticized for it. At times they were criticized for playing too hard, right? Uh, which is which is kind of nuts to, to, to think about it uh, at the time, right? Like you're criticizing me for playing too hard, right? You know, so it's there's all these different ways, but um, you know, in the Netherlands there's a, there are a number of different players that had instrumental impacts on the game and how they shaped this kind of instrumental style of Dutch football, which is called total football, right? Mm -hmm. And so I try to I try to argue in the book that these players uh, added a, a specific wrinkle to the game, to the style of the game. 
Mm. I'm just going to name a player and you tell me uh, their importance. Or maybe you think, yeah, that's not somebody I'm looking at. Uh, but, and like, does this player matter and why do they matter? I just have two on my head, two that yeah. y- you, ju- you just named a lot of the people that I wanted to ask you about. But let me ask you, Mario Balotelli. Yeah. I love Mario Balotelli. Uh, he matters, though. I know you love him as a player, but he yes. matters to your area of study. He's part yes. of that continuum. Uh, well, yes. He. I, I don't talk about him specifically um, within the chapters, but he's definitely a part of that tradition, right? When thinking about critiquing, particularly the media, right, and and their portrayal of him, right, the kind of classic visual I have of Mario Balotelli is when he's playing for Manchester City, he scores the goal and he lifts up his shirt. And it says, why always me, right? <laughs> why is he always the center of, of these of these attacks, right? When the team is doing bad, why is it always Mario Balotelli's fault, right? And so Mario Balotelli has a fascinating career. He's also one of a few, few Black players on the Italian national team. We rarely see Black players on the Italian national team. Um, and that added to kind of his contentious relationship with the nation. Mm. Okay, Mbappe. Oh. The wonder, the wonder kid, right? The yeah. wonder kid. Uh, does, does he does he matter to this continuum? He does. He does. Um, a lot of people praise Mbappe, of course, for his quality on the pitch, uh, his goal scoring ability. Um, but he also has a political side, right? I believe it was the 2018 World Cup um, where where feminist protesters, right, invaded the invaded the pitch, and he's like, you know, what? Cool. He's like, let's take pictures, right? And so he's he's and and he's expressed his independence as a player right and as black athletes when you articulate your independence as a player um the media is going to lash out at you and so he has the courage to do that as a as a as a black footballer uh in europe um and of course his quality allows him to do the things that he's able to do i think his quality also protects him uh in a lot of ways as well and last one marcus rashford Uh, i mean marcus rashford i mean just brilliant player on the pitch. His community work uh, in England is is unmatched. Um, again, just you know, a, a top notch, a top notch player. You know, there's there's certain players that I, I I sometimes grapple with, right? I mean, I think I think we can do this with all athletes, right? Sometimes there's a desire to kind of want more. Uh, kind of uh, radical <laughs> politics. Um, that's not to say he doesn't have a radical politics. I'm not necessarily sure how radical his politics are, but from the work that he's done within the community, it shows that he obviously um, he obviously sees his importance outside of the pitch, right? And that's and that's critical for for black players. Yeah, and his his work on child hunger during COVID. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's one of the most impactful moments an athlete Absolutely. had. I don't, th- I don't even think he realized the impact he was going to have. I mean, forcing Boris Johnson to do a massive, massive change in terms of feeding kids during Absolutely. a desperate time. Incredible. Right. And, it's, and it's just a testament to how, how footballers are able to use the game, right? Or use their platform to, to make these kind of national uh, changes. Well, you've been so generous with your time, Professor Scott. Is there anything we're missing about your area of study and work that you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, no, I, you know, I think we covered it. You know, I think the main, uh, I think the main uh, argument that I'm really trying to drive home is that soccer allows players, allows black footballers, allows black soccer supporters, allows black people to, to, to renegotiate their relationship to the nation, right? Um, I'm writing in this tradition of a political theorist named Richard Iton, who, who critiques the nation state as an anti-Black formation, right? And so what does that mean for Black citizenship? What does that mean for Black nationality, right? And he tries to he tries to wrestle with that, right? He tries to say, well, what if it's okay, right, to, to question nationality? What if it's okay to not have a nationality or to live in this kind of in-between space, right? And I think soccer uh, provides, a good, provides a good vehicle to do that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, the book is called... Black Soccer, Football and Politics in the African Diaspora. I cannot wait to read it. I'm sure our audience feels the same way. Professor Scott, thank you so much for joining us here on Edge of Sports. Dave, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. 
Solidarity forever.